All right, please be joined this time by Coach Gio De La Pena of Central Gwinnett. Excited about this one because we're talking operations, and I think that's a new thing for our clinic, adding that topic on. But I think what you're going to find in the coming years is there's going to be a lot of operations talk, and this field's only going to grow. So, Coach, thanks for joining me. Thanks for preparing something. Excited to hear what you got to say, man. No problem, Coach. I'm excited to be here. Uh, one of the main questions I get is just, you know, what does a director of operations do? Right. And it's a very open ended position. I think, uh, you know, head coaches around the country use that position for for many different things. It's been my experience. You know, this is my third program that I've been a DFO for that. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an organizational position. Um, I've gone as simple as, hey, I'm just handling social media and the website and, you know, minor budgeting issues to, hey, all budgeting organization you know, make sure that aligns with the head coach's vision and, and we're rolling. And so my, my first step in any of those is to develop a team calendar, right? Um, I, I'm blessed to, to work with Coach Harold, who's really organized, and uh, he has a, a really finite vision of what he wants to do with the program. And so, we, uh, you know, after the last game of the season, we sat down immediately and we're like, hey, what do we need to do to improve, you know, and what can we, what can we do to set up our coaches to be successful? And so we developed this calendar from exactly like this, this day, our final game of the season, all the way to December of 2023, right? And so um, especially young coaches, they all, you know, their minds always, hey, spring practice, summer OTAs, preseason. There's so much more that goes into it, though, right? And so when I, when I sit down and look at the calendar, the first thing I look at is when do we need coaches to be here? Right. What when I when I'm talking to our, our coaches and I'm talking to Coach Harold, when do coaches have to be in the building? So that's kind of the first thing that goes into the calendars. Hey, you know, we're doing eighth grade eighth grade workouts on these days. We're doing parent meetings on these days. Um, starting in March, these are the days you know that you have times available open to to do your position work. Um, and then obviously you know, and in, in, in a minute I'll talk more about budgeting items and fundraisers. But um, you know, making sure that our staff you know, returning in, you understand this is where you're, when you're going to be expected to be here. Because I mean, uh, you know, at the end of the day, yes, we're football coaches, but we're, we're family men. We have teaching responsibilities. A lot of us run side hustles. And so I feel like going into a, an off season, you know, knowing the main days that you're expected to be there is, is very helpful. And so you can kind of see here, this is our, our, our very simple calendar that we developed for January. Hey, here, here's kind of what we're doing. You know, here in Winnett County, we started school uh, today, January the 5th. And so we can kind of see what, what, we're, what we're doing. Um, our, our next item, right, is, hey, when do we get to see our, our younger crew? Uh, I know around the state and around the country, uh, a lot of people, if not most, have full access to run their middle school program. Uh, here in Winnett County, we don't yet. It goes through the parks. And so a lot of the very first times that we actually get to meet our, our feeder program is in our eighth grade workouts, right? We can go watch their games and everything, but we don't really know them as far as players and people and developing a relationship until we get them for those eighth grade workouts uh, in the spring semester of their eighth grade year. And so we go ahead and set, you know, we're coach Harold and I will set up times, you know, next week, set up times to go meet with those middle school athletic directors get information in those eighth graders' hands. Hey, this is when our workouts are. Um, we've already reached out to the rec leagues, and so they kind of have an idea. And, and we make sure that, hey, you have, we have a parent meeting on this day. Um, in our community, Zooms are very welcome. You know, it's a, a high, you know, high working community where everyone has a job. And so you're trying to, hey, come meet us at seven. Hey, well, half of us are working at seven, but that's not going to work. But we can do a Zoom. And so we set up these Zoom meetings for parents to make it more convenient and, and so that we get better attendance rates. Um, and so you see that we set, we set up meetings. Uh, we have our ninth year workout set. Uh, and then you'll, you'll start seeing here in February, especially you start seeing things about fundraisers, right? And so that's one of the main things that I do on the operational side is I sit down once Coach, once Coach Harold has, uh, you know, said, hey, here's what we need to do. Here's the purchases we need to make. Here is the the items that we're going to need, and we budget out, right? Um, ideally, you want to make it to where, for a seven day program, a, a comfortable number for um, you know for parents not to have to to bust out too much money on themselves, or for 
for players to not have to fundraise an, an insane amount of money. Uh, our magic number that we found is six fifty per player for dues. Um, and so we give them four fundraisers throughout the year to be able to raise that without having to, you know, go out of pocket or really kind of extend their parents too much. Uh, and I'll talk more about that here in a minute, but just our, in our calendar, that's the next step we do is, all right, cool. So here's the fundraisers that we've done in the past. Here's some new ones that we've been introduced to at clinics and such. And through our coaching resources, how can we run them? Right. And so for us, uh, we've seen success and in, in one of our year round fundraisers with selling meat. Um, and so we, we have that on the calendar. The players know, Hey, beginning of the month, we put those orders in, we deliver them towards the middle of the month and that's an ongoing thing. So you'll see that on the calendar. Um, you know, we do a textathon. I know that's really big right now. There's a bunch of companies out there that are, um, you know, very successful in, in providing a, a high profit, uh, very small involvement as far as, you know, players having to go anywhere or do a lot to be able to raise a maximum amount for your program. So we do that as well. Um, and so you'll see that from for in our program from January through May are our heavy fundraising, let's collect dues months. Um, and our, our logic behind that is honestly that when we get to, to, to the summer, that's when we start spending, right? We do a lot of summer billing, a lot of fall billing on the items that we order to be prepared for the season. And so we want to be able to have the, that money ready to go for when those bills are due. Um, as well as just, I... I I know, I, just in my experience, when you get to spring ball, man, from spring ball to the season, it's a blink and boom, you're there. And you don't want to be dealing with, hey, let me collect player dues. I'll set up another fundraiser. And so, you know, pl players know, hey, this is when we're doing it. You know, at our parent meeting, the, the parents get a schedule, and I'm kind of going to show you guys how, how that looks of payment plans and everything. Um, and so we'll have that. We have our golf tournament down here. Uh, we also do sponsorships, which I'm going to show you guys a little bit of. Um, a liftathon, uh, and that's you know we we've kind of evolved that over the years from hey you know hey let's just donate per what my player develops to hey we're gonna have a, like a whole jamboree with it. We invite the parents to come see all the maxes and all the field events that we do, and it becomes a community event. Um, and so yeah, once once we've set up what days the coaches have to be here, eighth grade workouts. Uh, we're fortunate enough to be on block scheduling and have to, uh, you know two weight training periods. And so our, our kids, we get to see them every day. Um, we have a, a group of coaches that run after school workouts for those guys who have conflicting schedules with weight training. You know, they're doing work base, they're doing um oh um not work base, but when they, you know, the um the uh college courses. Um and so they they have other things to do. We have that available for them as well. Um and then we you know, the, the third step is when when do the players have to be here, right? So the ninth grade workouts you see on here, um, on our more detailed calendar that goes on our website, players see, hey, you know, this is when we start doing our precision work. Um, this is when we start, you know, getting ready for the season. This is what time practice are. This is what time you're expected to be here. But again, you won't in our calendar, you won't really see that until the beginning of the actual fall season because we have them in weight training. Um, and so we see, you know, 95% of our players every day. And then going into May, you know, that's step four. We, we start looking at, hey, who, who are we scrimmaging? Do we have a contract with anybody? How do we want to set practice up according to the GHSA rules? Um, you can kind of see another fundraiser snuck in there and another payment date. But our, our um, you know, I sit down with Coach Harrell or, you know, my head coach and I and I start discussing, hey, what do you, what do you want spring to look like? What do you want summer to look like? Do, do we want to give them what days off? How long do we want to go? Do we want to give them a break in between getting out of class and coming to spring ball? That kind of stuff. Whenever we're going to do the ninth grade um, spring practices. And so as, a, as an operations guy, you're really just the middleman between your head coach's vision. And what the public and the coaching staff and the players see. Right. And so uh, moving forward here again, June, you begin to see it stacked. We have summer workouts. We have um, our last fundraiser. Uh, you, we, we have our, our first OTA. We haven't put our camps on there yet because they haven't released the dates for those. Um, same thing with July. You see our second OTA. You see we have a youth camp. We have a youth coaches clinic. Um, you know, and that's that's kind of something that I've taken on is kind of being the outreach person to our 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 community and our rec program to be able to 
have a better relationship with them as we establish our, our second year as a program with this coaching staff to be able to to kind of not just have a, our vision that Coach Harold has for this as the program, but the program being all of Lawrenceville, you know, K through 12. Um, and then, like I said, that, that you know, from spring practice to, to August, it's a blink of an eye. And then we've, you know, Coach Harold's done a great job of, of already setting up the schedule. I just put it on the calendar. We have game, we have really good game contracts. Our region's already set. And so we just, you know, have a conversation about, hey, you know, this is how we did practice last year. Do we want to change those times? Do we want to include a study hall in there? And so those discussions are going on right now. And so this is just a kind of a blanket schedule that we have here. But um, yeah, that's that's kind of the the core of, of a director of operations. We look at, hey, here's how you want to do your calendar. Here's what you want to have on there. Here's what you want to plan for. Um, and again, you know, we all know that, you know, planning is great, but then you get people that move in, people that move out, um, people that want to try out late. And so having the calendar isn't just a, hey, this is set in stone. We're going to be great. Everyone knows what we're doing. It's a good reference point for when you're in the middle of the summer, middle of the spring, middle of the season, and you have all these moving parts. It, it kind of holds you together and accountable. All right, here we go. Um, and so one of, one of the main things, again, operation and budgeting wise that I do is, you know, set up once Coach Harold has his vision of what we need to purchase and what we need to do and what we need to do for coaches and everything with budget. Um, you know, we, we go through that together. We go through our booster club. Um, it's a quick conversation of, hey, this is what we need. And then let's, let's make a let's put a plan together on how we go out and get it. Um, this is what our parents get. This is this letter from Coach Harold, you know making sure that they understand, hey, this is what we're fundraising for. This is what we're raising dues for is to be able to grow a 7-day program. Um, you know, and I'm more than willing to share this so you can see the verbiage, so you can do what you want with it. Um, in our particular program right now, we're going from not having a ninth grade program to having one. And so there's a big push to be able to be able to have more coaches, the equipment we need, transportation is then the third. And so we, we you know, it's a lot of growth. Uh, when we got here, we were expected to have about 75 kids and we ended up with over 120 and it's going to keep growing. And so there's, you know, the, you need to have money. Um, you can see here, um, our expectation is every player raises or pays 650. I outline exactly what that 650 gets you. It's everything that you need. You know, they still get a player pack with that. They get all the meals, nutrition, everything that we have to offer, OTAs, 7 on 7 equipment, O-line equipment for camps uniforms, you know, everything you need is covered in that 650. After that, you know, you get perks as far as like additional, you know, banquet, your, you know, your player packs down here include more swag. Um, but then this is what the parents really want to look at most of the time is what, when do I pay? Right. Um, this year we made the decision to switch to a lot of digital payments, right? We have a square, um, a little terminal, for Square to accept payments. Um, we've done cash app and stuff in the past and it just gets messy. Square just does a great job of you can track it easy. Um, it's a minimal fee. And you know, you can send you can even set up a link on your website so people can pay through there. And so it's it's just become a better organizational tool for us. I know there's other things out there. I know I've seen I've even seen people use Shopify. So I mean there's that's a whole conversation, another clinic we could run as far as what payment method uh, you accept, you know. Cold, hard cash is always nice as well. We take checks. And so, um, but the, uh, to, to us, the payment schedule is important, right? Because it gives us, for the parents, it gives you a timeline of, okay, hey, we, you as my, my son have to fundraise this much by a certain amount of time. And additionally, you know, I know this is when we're going to do it. You know, we have a great communication system through um, Rank One, which is something that our county provides. And so there's emails going out, there's messages going out. So the parents know and remember, hey, we're constantly doing this. And so we end up, you know, pretty well on. We had, you know, 100% participation in our, in our dues this year. And so that was a great move. And, uh, and this kind of gives parents a good guideline to, hey, this is what I have to do. You see, you know, May 17th is kind of like that, that hard deadline for, you know, having that 650 completely in. Uh, and then obviously, you know, you want uh, uh, to me, you know, and regardless of, you know, the socioeconomics of, of your community, you got to have some leeway. You know, these are parents with multiple children, multiple jobs, multiple things going on in their life. And so we do extend it to, 
a little, you know, in, into late June to be able to give those parents a chance, especially if they're trying to get their kids that extra swag or whatever they might want. But, uh, you know, our goal is by when we come back from dead week in July, we are done with finances. We're focusing on football, we're focusing on these young men to make sure that they're getting what they need. And we have our budget in place and we're good to go. Um, you know, our parents get this explanation of all of our fundraisers so that they understand, hey, here's when they're happening. Here's what they're about. Here's the expectations for each player. And so the, the expectations for each player, uh, I've built them out to where each, if you do each of the fundraisers, you're covered and then some for our for our dues. You don't have to pay anything out of pocket. Um, and so I, I have a, a spreadsheet that I have. Um, I'm not going to share it just because it has a lot of sensitive information right now from our players and their payment and, and everything. But it, I, I've set it to where it calculates everything for me. Right. So I know if a player raised, you know, four hundred dollars in stake sales, it calculates 40 percent of that. And this is how much is going towards your dues. You know, and so it it takes it and, and does that for me. So as they keep fundraising or they keep paying, we keep track of where the money came in from, what percentage gets to go towards their dues. And then, at, you know, June 29th, May 17th, whatever the date might be that we're doing the check in to see how much you owe. It's already set up there. Um, and lastly, you know, we have members in our community who may not be parents, who may not be directly involved or have a kid in the program, but they want to be involved. And so we, I, I've set up these booster club options to be able to, to not only, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just about the money, you know, that it helps and it's great and it's a little boost here and there. But it's just about getting people involved, right? It gets them into the, in, into the castle, right? It's, it's what our, our stadium is called because we have a literal castle as our um, concession stand and press box. But it also, you know, we have a hospitality suite. We People get more swag. They get central gear so that they can feel more at home. And it brings that community in so that we can, you know, our boys feel supported and, and our coaching staff has the that sense of community that we all kind of long for as coaches. Exclusive formatting, this is usually a Word document, but a Google Docs messed with me. Um, this is our, our sheet, a very simple sheet that we send out to the community uh, when we go track and and go look for sponsorships. Um, I know a lot of coaches, um, you know, send emails and they have long, long standing contacts for, for fundraising, but I, I've just had so much better luck with just, you know, feet on the ground, you know, putting on a nice polo, a good jacket, some nice pants and going around to our sponsors, new or old, and, you know, shaking their hand, getting to meet them. Coach Cheryl and I will do that. And, and just going out and, you know, here's a short, simple letter explaining what we're trying to do. But really getting to know them. Hey, how can we give you more business? You know, so we we have a, a massive amount of restaurants around us. Hey, how what can we do to bring more to you in return for you donating to us? Um, and so here are our sponsorship levels are very basic and simple to follow. Uh, we start low um, for our golf tournament. You know, if you want to be a whole sponsor, there's here's what you get. Um, again, uh, a teammate sponsor. This is our, our our small local business that just want to get involved and have small bit of advertising, but still help out the you know the community it is a great option for them. We have about thirty teams that do that, that you know teams or companies that that do that and and really help us out. And then we get into our castle sponsorships, Black Knight level sponsorships, Gold level and Excalibur. Um, uh, we've kind of adopted those; those have been long standing here at Central as far as those names. The community is familiar with them. Um, but we're flexible with them. A lot of our, our restaurants are like, hey, we don't necessarily, we can't donate money. Can we donate this amount of food that equals that amount for that sponsorship? And yeah, you know, we get your pregame meals taken care of. Um, make sure that the guys have good nutrition. And uh, you, you're kind of set to go, right? All right, here. And then I have one more pulled up here, but I'm not seeing it right away. That's okay. I'll go back to this. Um, our, what, and then kind of the final, the final piece that I, I deal with, and again, uh, this is you know beyond the director of operations role or the associate head coach job that I have. Um, I'm also the college recruiting coordinator, um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that because this is the season where you're you know you're trying to finalize your your senior class to be able to sign and everything, and um. I've been to places that once that season ends, man, those seniors are, hey, you're out of the weight room, you're out of the way, is then the third. And uh, that's not that's not how we do it here. We take care of those guys through graduation. 
And so the um, something that that we are doing right now is making sure, hey, if you haven't done your FAFSA, you know, have you done it? Have you updated your SAT profile? Have you updated your NCAA, your, uh, NCAA profile? Have you done this and that? Getting them ready. You know, a lot we have a lot of kids with offers. Uh, no one's really committed yet. They're going to here in the next month. But um, uh, it's, it's something I wanted to touch on because anyone that's dealing with it right now knows that the transfer portal in college is making it exponentially harder on us as coaches to be able to get these guys to sign early. You know, if they don't have those big stars next to their name or they don't have the recognition early on, you know, they're really having to, you know, grind it out and really prove themselves, which I think is a great life experience as far as, hey, you know, out in the real world, I'm going to have to do this. But it's also a little bit overwhelming for a 17, 18 year old to be like, oh, hey, you know, like I've, I've given my all for four years. I actually have no idea how to do this side of it. But, um, you know, I, I think I think it's been great uh, so far here at Central Winnet, we've, we've been able to get, you know, nine guys offers. We've been able to get uh, multiple offers for a lot of them. And um, when I say we, it's really unfair. It's really them. You know, we, we um, uh, Coach Harold and I do a good job of, hey, you know, if you post something on Twitter or if you want me to post something on Twitter, I can. But, I mean, it, it's their work. You know, they have great GPAs. Um, they've been able to really push forward in their game and show they can compete at a high level. And so, you know, they just need a little nudge in the right direction. And so that's what we've been doing. Uh, we do a great job, um, me and the other coaches that help out at, at keeping things organized. You know, we have a, a good profile, a good um, prospect sheet that that outlines who's talked to what player, um, where people have really uh, gone on any college visits, anyone who's come visit us. Um, we try to do follow up to all of our coaches that come through from you know, regardless whether it's JUCO all the way up to, you know, power five. Hey, thanks for coming coach. You know, you look, take a look at these guys. I want to make sure you, you, you know, we stay with you and stay in touch. If you have any questions, let us know. Um, and something that, you know, from the operation side for recruiting that I've, I've really, you know, hit hard on is the, is digitizing everything. Um, you know, I remember just even five years ago going to all the recruiting fairs and just having stacks of transcripts and and all these things to hand to recruiters. And so you see these guys walking around with everything. Uh, we've made everything uh, QR codes, Google Docs, um, you know, more, um, easy to read PDF so that coaches can just scan and go. Uh, we, we do a great job of keeping again, like along with keeping track of who contacts us and reaching out to them. It's just following up, you know, and we um, and we have recruiting clinics where we talk to our players and show them how to kind of run their own recruiting and do it responsibly. You know, let's not fault to advertise. Let's be true to your talent, be true to your grades. Um, and, you know, just be responsible young men. And so, um, uh, and uh, probably the last area for my particular role as a director of football operations and associate head coach is dealing with the non-football um, staff of our, of our program, right? That's our, our managers, our filmers, um, our, our training staff. And so, um, you know, we're, we're extremely fortunate. We have a great relationship with North Star Hospital here when that, um, our team doctor, Dr. Wusu is, is amazing. He takes care of our guys, um, our two medical staff, you know, Machina and, and Mr. Joey do an amazing job of, you know, I don't take care of football, but our entire school athletically, um, and then we we're fortunate that we have longstanding managers. You know, we we have two different staffs of of student assistants that 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 I manage. We have our our managers, right? They work with our medical staff to to take care of the water, you know, tape, making sure inventory's up, whatever they need for practice to make sure that that's rolling. And then we have our film staff, um, you know, and that's something that in in the last you know ten twelve years we've we've grown, we have drones, we have sign line towers, we have end zone towers, you know, here we're fortunate to be able to have turf and have the castle that we can film from. And so um, it's great because we're able to, to expose kids to a, a real life career. Hey, look, like this is like sports casting at its best. And it provides a service that, you know, it, it keeps from having to take a coach off the field and letting them be part of the actual practice and, and giving these kids the experience and the knowledge to be able to be responsible, to work with technology and, and to learn a new craft. 
right? I mean, I just people are people our age and are are so scared of technology. We're trying to eliminate that for this next generation, and it's a great exposure experience. Um, and so, you know, I've I've gotten a lot of questions. Hey, do you make your managers pay dues? Do you make them fundraise? And I, you know, we've gone back and forth a lot in, in this program about whether to do that or not. At the end of the day, we decide not to. Um, we're fortunate that our our managers, you know, both both staffs of them are our training managers and our film managers actually like to fundraise because they want to feel part of the team and they got all into the competition of it and they like to get a couple of, you know. They, they know that we're paying for some of the gear that we give them. And so they, they're trying to kind of lobby for, hey, you know, can we get like an extra hoodie or something? And, you know, that's how much we fundraised. And so it's it's fun because, again, they're, they're part of our community and they understand the importance of it all. And they, and, they, and they volunteer to do so. We don't ever ask them to pay anything out of dime because they're providing a huge service for us. Um, and probably something and, and, you know, what another thing to add on for operations that's really blown up here in the next 10, in the last, you know, five, 10 years is the nutrition side, right? You have um, some of the more upscale programs in our state that have full kitchens dedicated to serving, you know, multiple meals a day to our players. Um, and, and we're working towards that here at Central Winnet. Uh, what we do, and I know a lot of programs around us do, is we provide, you know, ample, ample amounts of protein for our players uh, for after workouts, before practice, after practice, uh, we have a great relationship with a, with our local co-op and local businesses that provide food and snacks for our players. We have, you know, a great amount of protein, um, you know, at, you name any type of protein bar, peanut butter bar that, you know, we, we have it on, on stack and we, we provide that for our players. Uh, we work with a couple of uh, food services in our, in, in our community and surrounding community to be able to provide summer food for our players. Uh, that's two meals a day. We bring them in early. They, they eat breakfast. We feed them after practice, along with the snacks and protein as well. Um, and then during the off season, we we have um, some of our our student aides provide nutrition in the form of uh, we have a, a a protein shake machine. Uh, you know that makes the protein quick and easy. You pour it out. Boom. Here's the players. Here's your cup. And then they make peanut butter jelly sandwiches for the guys. And so, you know, as we work towards, hey, you know, from peanut butter jelly to moving on to pure protein, like white meat and stuff, um, that's something that we, we always look into, um, you know, and I think that's irregardless of socioeconomic status. You know, you, you, a lot of people will say, well, you know, like if you work at a poorer school, you need to do that, but maybe not us because we're, you know, more fluent. But at the end of the day, you know, kids are hungry. We're pushing them to burn up upwards of 5,000 calories a day sometimes. And so that nutrition piece lets them recuperate faster, gain more muscle, and, and just be overall healthy, healthier in the long run. And so that's that's something that, you know, over time, you know, I won't take full credit, but our, our coaching staff is organized real well through our connections and our, our desire to really be able to provide these kids with, with the nutrition they need for what we demand of their bodies. And so, yeah, I mean, just to kind of recap, making sure you have a set calendar for um, for all of your events. You know, again, to me as a coach with a family, it's always important to know when I'm going to be there, what times, you know, what's expected of me. Um, you know, our, I, I didn't really touch on coaching responsibilities because my head coach is so good at establishing those, making sure those are communicated, um, making sure that people understand your fundraising, how that's coming along, expectations for players and coaches on how to what, when things are due, fundraising and everything. Um you know, making sure that all your all your games, practices, OTAs, camps are all set up and ready to go. Um, you know, college recruiting wise, making sure you're set there. And then nutrition. I mean, and and again, that's just kind of touching the surface. Um, if you're talking in season, you're looking at making sure buses are coming at the right time, that they're scheduled. Um, you know, communicating with the refs if you need to, if your head coach is busy. And so on the operation side, um, you know, and I, I'm, I'm in the middle of making a, a big portfolio right now to kind of walk step by step through this. But um, it's it, it's just about being organized. And, and, you know, the more experience you have in both operations and football, the more little, you know, trinkets you learn. Um, you know, depending on your staff, we're fortunate to have an amazing equipment manager here. So, you know, as an operations guy, I don't have to deal with that side of it. He, he does an amazing job. Um, our medical staff is great here. And so again, they kind of, they're self-functioning. Hey, here, what do you need? Here it is. And, and they run with it. Um, 
we're we're very fortunate that prior coaching staffs were able to provide things here as far as equipment goes, and so we haven't had to really dip into that. Um, and so we're able to really focus on the kids and the, and the things that we need moving forward are just to grow the program. And so that's kind of um, as a director of football operations, your job is to really ensure that the program is running smoothly, so that players and coaches can thrive and succeed and grow through your head coach's vision. Um, and again, I'm I'm the kind of guy coach that, that I don't mind sharing resources at all. I know that yeah, that's how you that's how you make your bucks. So I know you know you you can appreciate that wholeheartedly. But uh, anything guys want from me, I'm willing to share. You know, and so that, that's pretty that, much what I got today. Yeah, I think one of the things that you know I didn't know it at the time, but turned out to propel me into this uh this what I'm doing now is when I was coaching, I was doing all this, everything you mentioned, every single thing I did, everyone. And then I just had them saved, and now I start helping coaches, showing them like you're doing it. But back then, and by back then I mean 15 years ago, but also just <laughs> four years ago, you know, just four years ago, it was way more expected of the head coach to be good at all those things. And I like to think I was, and that's why we were successful, but it's really not fair to ask a man who made his name being great with kids and being great at coaching and practice get fired. Let's be real. They get 100%. fired because they're not great at some stuff that, that they logistically they needed to be. And that happens a lot and That's you've got to be both. And so I think you're going to see in the bigger program, especially in Gwinnett, but even in medium sized programs, you're going to see more and more people, dedicated to that now you coach football you're a ball coach too but why do you have to be like why can't somebody that works at the school that teaches english that doesn't even know the first thing about inside drill or pass scale why can't they be a member of the coaching staff like why does ever i think you're going to see more and more coaches yep right they hire you they hire a coach that doesn't know anything about defense to coach the wide receivers why wouldn't you hire a coach that doesn't know anything about offense or defense. And, and the coach, I, some of the booster club stuff, some of the, you know, I mean, I think you're going to see this job grow and grow and grow. And you can be a pioneer of it. Well, I was excited to have you on here because I think you're going to see this job grow and grow and grow. I really do. For sure. No, and I mean, like like you said, I coach ball and everything, but I I, had, I haven't had a position in a while. I, I've been able to just focus on this because the need's been so great. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was, I, I came, I came onto it kind of by accident. You know, I was, I was a, a young dad with a bunch of kids. Uh, you know, my wife had a busy job too, and she was, she was doing this, that, and the third. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with, uh, you know, Coach Malouf and Norcross. I was a super understanding. Was like, Hey, you're good at all this kind of technology stuff. Uh, you know, I want to keep you on staff. I want to make sure you're successful. Um, kind of take this over for me. And so throughout the years, you know, I, I took on more and more and more. And then we, we realized there's so much that people just kind of do on the side that kind of gets overlooked and we can make the program better. if We kind of, you know, mm -hmm. it and, and, and have protocols for it. And then, you know, coach to grace and then out here and it's, it's been the same. And so I, yeah. I think you're right. The more and more our, our, we grow, you know, as our, our sport becomes not just on the field, but off the field. And, you know, with all the other different, you know, possible distractors that we have, you know, I, I see more and more people promoting that they need a DFO, that they have a DFO. You know, I've talked to a couple of different districts about what a DFO actually is in the past. And I mean, it's I think it's and making an happen. investment in because yep. I think what you find is there's not a coach in Georgia that doesn't want somebody to help. Them. Mm, but are they willing to make that an important part of the staff? Are they willing to pay it a higher sub? Are they willing to you're going to see that stuff change? And it changed, and, and it's really going. I mean, it changed at the college level, obviously, you know, twenty years ago or so. But it's, um, but even at the lower college level, you're going to see it more and more because of transfer portal and stuff like that. Those guys don't have the kind of staffs. They got high school size staff. They can't run all that stuff, and so exactly the support staff's going to be um, more important than it's ever been. And you know, in NFL, I'm not trying to be dramatic with it, but in the NFL, the general manager who now seen as the boss of the coach, big yep. guy. That job started out as nothing. Exactly. You know, I mean, you think Vince Lombardi had a general manager? Tell him, you know, like, <laughs> no. that's not how that worked. But over time, that job got so important. They had people doing the job. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying they weren't over. 
And as the job got more and more important, it became more and more prestigious. People start paying it more or whatever. I think you're going to see that in college for sure. And I think in high school, you're going to see more and more people dedicate resources to finding people to help. And um, so I commend anybody listening to this that's trying to, you know, find their way. If you know, if you want to make a name for yourself, it's a great way to make a name for yourself like you're doing. If you are a head coach and you need some help, you need to say you need some help. I wouldn't get run off without asking. I need some help. So um, I appreciate you taking some time, man. And I wish you guys the best. I think a lot of you and um, Coach Harold, I love him. So uh, (laughs) you guys get after it. And uh, if I can ever help you, man, let me know. For sure, Coach. I appreciate the opportunity, man. We'll stay in touch. And, uh, you know, I love following your stuff. You guys have a lot of great stuff out there. Yeah, if I can help you anyway, let me know. Take care, man. You too. Take care, Coach.